Angela Franklin is a deaf midwife, herbalist, folk artist, and community death care advocate living in the Illinois Valley of Southern Oregon. Angela and her husband Michael offer non-medical end-of-life services through Crossroads Community Death Care. She has studied natural dying for over a decade and studies death midwifery at Sacred Crossings with Olivia Barham. She feels the rekindling of ancestral practices are key to decolonizing our world and providing agency to the collective. Uh, I want to just welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Uh, you know, there's so many different things that we're going to be talking about today. And I know that many people are going to be coming um, from different avenues of being interested in natural dyeing of fabrics, and then also interested in natural dyeing uh, for end of life. Uh, also, um, yeah, I just wanna thank the Guild, Joyce and everyone for hosting this because as many people probably know, talking about death and funerals and burial practices isn't something that is uh, a topic that we much talk about. It's pretty taboo um, in many uh, our, our Western culture. So thank you for coming and showing up for that. So I come from a culture where my uh, burial practices and funeral practices were laid out for me. I was raised in the Baha'i faith and, uh, and that is a religion that uses burial shrouds and also has uh, burial ceremonies of preparing a body and doing the shrouding and has very specific ways of doing that. So from a very young age, I knew that that was going to be part of my experience. And the very first um, burial shroud that I had had experience shrouding someone with, and the very first time I ever touched uh, a dead body was my mother. And so that was an experience that I feel would have been so much heavier. And um, if I did not have these practices to help me through. And so that was really the beginning of my journey into uh, death midwifery is coming from the space of my husband uh, was very interested in death care and, you know, kind of had the experience of coming up with like, oh, a death doula, isn't that an amazing term? And then like Googling it and finding out, oh, that's actually a thing. <laughs> I didn't just like come up, <laughs> you know, on my own with this. And I, because of my upbringing, you know, I had somewhat of knowledge that I was going to be intimate with death at some point, but it wasn't until I was my mother's caretaker and uh, went through the entire process with her that I realized that death wasn't as scary or as difficult as I expected it to be going into that experience. Um, and so about a month after I, a month after my mom passed away, I um, and my husband, we found a notice in the paper, I believe, that a woman was giving a talk about death midwifery. And that happened to be Olivia Barham. And we went to this talk and everything just like clicked for me all of the things that I had experienced taking care of my mom, um, you know, to be in her caregiver, really supporting and advocating for um, her comfort. And um, because of 
our specific burial practices. That meant that we had to work with the funeral directors in Missouri, in a very conservative small town, and ask them to allow us to be able to utilize the mortuary as a place to prepare um, her body. And so I had a lot of like really intense, quick experiences that a lot of uh, death doulas and death midwives do experience um, before I even knew that that was something that was a thing. So um, I wanted to, I prepared a bit of a slideshow uh, with Zoom. That's the hard thing is that to convey, you know, natural dyes and burial shrouds through Zoom, it's hard. And so I put together a, um, a slideshow so I can talk and still reference a lot of um, the concepts. And so today, this is just gonna be an introductory into a number of things. Um, we're gonna talk about different types of burial shrouds um, from Western cultures and other cultures from all over the world. Uh, we're going to go into specifically eco printing and natural dyeing and how I have crafted a death care ceremony around that dying technique um, that I have felt has brought out a lot for the community and for individuals. Uh, and then we're gonna go into a breakout session where we're gonna go into groups and you'll have a chance to uh, engage with people and kind of explore some of the things that we've, that I'll be talking about. And then we're gonna leave the last bit open for a Q&A. And so that will be the chance if you want to ask any questions that come out through this presentation. Um, and it can be relating to natural dyeing, natural fabric dyeing, to just death midwifery, anything is up. So basically like ask a death midwife for the last half an hour of um, the presentation. And for those who cannot stay, um, you know, feel free to drop off after we finish that or before we go into the Q&A. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about burial shrouds and kind of the evolution of what was the, what first started and, um, and these two examples are from Western cultures, European. Uh, so we have what are burial garments and this is um, on your left screen. And so these are, basically really elaborate clothing. And this is from the Victorian era. And so they're open on the back so that you can easily put them onto a body and with different um, stiffening. It's a little bit, you know, you have to be very creative sometimes to get the, the shroud completely fastened and everything. And then the next one over is more of what we call a winding sheet. And so today, a lot of the shrouds that people know about are kind of a more of a winding sheet because we're wrapping the body and it's less of the actual garments that are open in the back. And I wanted to just go through some of the shrouds from different cultures around the world. Uh, this one is the Hindi cremation shroud. Lots of color in these shrouds. 
many of the Native American cultures utilize sky burials. And so the bodies would be shrouded with animal skins um, and other cloths. And I just wanted to just mention that I don't wanna make any sweeping generalizations on any cultures. So that's why I put many Native American cultures because there's so many different uh, burial and funeral practices that we can't just um, make it just one generalized statement. Uh, so I believe the Northern Plains uh, Indians were some of the folks that did the more of the scaffolding. And then you'll see pictures of in trees and then also um, canoe burials. So bodies would be sometimes shrouded and put in canoes that were off of the ground a couple of feet. And let's see, this is a Jewish burial shroud. Now both the men and women were shrouded in the same garments. And often were in only in white. This is a Sherpa cremation shroud. Uh, the Sherpa are the guides in Tibet and most of them would have been utilizing um, these types of shrouds for cremation. And below is a bardo shroud. And so this, the one on the back has a bunch of mantras on it and that will be utilized by other um, Tibetan Buddhists. And then this is a, an older photo of a Mayan burial shroud. And this is, from what I've read that they used uh, linen often, but from what I'm looking at, this actually looks like it is an animal skin. Um, so maybe it's both. And then the Islamic burial shroud, the kafan. So as a Baha'i, um, being raised as a Baha'i, a lot of our practices are rooted in Islam. And so this is actually the closest that I could get a picture of a Baha'i burial shroud as well. And so the male kafan consists of three layers of fabric and the, the women's kafan is of five layers of fabric. They add an extra one, the hijab on the head and then they have an extra almost like a skirt that goes around the torso inside of these shrouds. And so these are some shrouds um, that you can find today online through different companies and they're really well made. Um, they're not very expensive. They're still, I mean, caskets are, can range, you know, thousands of dollars. And the burial shrouds are anywhere from two to $900, depending on the fabric used. Here's some more. And so if you notice, most of the burial shrouds are white and there's been a lot of cultures that believe that you wanna go into the earth um, all the same, like not to be elevated above any other person when you die. And so it was only really the aristocracy and um, monarchs and, you know, people that really wanted to uh, differentiate themselves from a lower caste of people that were making these really elaborate um, you know, shrouds, kind of like the Victorian era. And this is one example, this Pia um, Interlandi, she's an artist from Australia and she's been recreating these really intricate 
burial garments and shrouds. And so this is a, a modern um, burial shroud that she's based on the elaborate Victorian ones. And it's, I mean, it can get really, really intricate and um, yeah, it's pretty amazing, the possibilities. So the next slide um, is for the local folks that I just wanted to um, give a, just a heads up that the next slides I'm going to be going into um, the Hazel and this so this is a woman that I was with for the last year and a half of her life, um, being her death midwife. And um, a lot of the photos of her burial shroud have been um, posted on social media, but I just wanted to let people know that we're gonna be doing that. So it's not like an abrupt of like, oh, that's Hazel. So, so this is um, Hazel's burial shroud and it turned out really, really well. And so this utilized um, five pieces of fabric and the eco printed part of the burial shroud is the inner layers. And normally I wouldn't, I would do the outer one as well with the eco printing, but she decided that she wanted the outer one to just be a solid naturally dyed color. So, um, just wanted to share, and that's her grand, one of her grandsons um, placing flowers on her. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful uh, funeral and everything that surrounded her death. So grateful. So this is the inside of the shrouds after the eco dying. Uh, the one on the left is from Hazel Shroud, and the one on the right is from a previous shroud dying. So eco printing, I just wanted to touch base on that. Uh, this is some of my older eco printing work, uh, and this is on felted wool was what I was utilizing the most when I first started doing eco printing. So eco printing is the transfer of the detail of leaves and flowers onto fabric. And you can tell it's very, like sometimes it's very, um, it, it looks really, you know, detailed. And then other times it's just like a faint. So with natural dyeing, it's kind of, you have to let go of expectations because every single time you do any sort of natural dyeing, you never know how it is gonna turn out. And one of the reasons why I like combining this craft with making shrouds is that, you know, there's such a mystery and a surrender that happens when you are really consciously dying and you, you don't know what's gonna happen. So just like a birthing plan, like you can plan out as much as you possibly can, but you still need to be open to what happens is what happens. And so that's kind of what the natural dying um, is in line with that. So one person that is amazing eco printer She's actually one of the reasons why I started going into it is a, um, a person named India Flint and she's an Australian artist. And she has come up with this technique of using eucalyptus leaves to do eco prints. And she gets these brilliant red and orange, you know, and rust colors. And um, it's just really beautiful. She creates clothing garments and um, who knows, maybe we'll see a, a burial shroud popping up there eventually from her. So some of the, the dye plants 
that um, I have utilized with natural dyeing um, is a lot of flowers, um, Coreopsis, Cosmo, but also uh, onion skins. So onion skins is like the main um, bulk dyeing plant that I use because it's so easy to go to the grocery store and just peel off all of the, you know, coming off the red onion skins and the yellow onion skins. If you have a produce person that you're, you know, in good with, you can usually get them when they're cleaning out their, uh, their boxes to just put all the onion skins and pick them up. Um, or if you clean them yourselves, they're like, what are you doing? And then they're like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, there's lots of ways to glean plant and dye materials. Um, the safflower, you can use the safflower that isn't the true safflower because that's a really expensive and probably not the most ethical um, plant to utilize because it takes so much to harvest the safflower. Um, black walnut, black eyed Susans. And then for the eco dyeing, utilizing leaves is really the main source of the designs. And harvesting the leaves when they are, um, before they start turning color in the fall. And you can harvest leaves and save them. And then when you're ready to use them, there's techniques to make sure. You just don't want them to get all crumbly. So storing them flat is good. Uh, fruit tree leaves, almost all fruit tree leaves leave really great colors. And so when this is some of the dye that I, um, one of the pictures from one of my dyeing demonstrations. And so when you do natural dyeing, there's things called mordants and it's something where you'll soak the fabric before you dye it and it helps things fix to the fabric. And then there's also mordants that you do after you put it in the dye bath and they will shift the color. Um, so, here we're looking at sumac berries. The red berries are sumac berries and sumac leaves. And you'll see that there's a kind of a, a pinkish rose color. And so that rose color is from the sumac berries. And then there's a gray color right next to it. So that is dipping into an iron solution. That pink will shift to the gray color. And so also on the other side, we have wolf lichen and we have the onion skins. And the onion skins present like a gold color and then dipping it in iron, it creates a darker green color. So the changes in colors can be very dramatic and um, there's different ones. There's uh, copper, there's iron, and then some of the other mordants, the pre-mordants are the tannins and the alum. And so in a future workshop, um, we'll go more in depth into the process of doing the dyeing um, because it, it is a process that takes a bit of time to go over and uh, I'll be doing a demonstration to do a burial shroud that is longer, more intense, and it might even be over a period of time because it takes, the process takes um, up to a few days to a month. So one of the other things that we, are gonna be talking about is creating ceremonies around death care practices. So shrouds, um, 
I created the first shroud um, for a community member that died here and she was very young. She was 27 years old and it was an ex unexpected death. And she was very popular um, amongst the community. I mean, everyone loved her. Um, her name was Scout. And I wanted to make her burial shroud and do a natural dying of it because she loved plants um, and she was leaned towards more of a witchy, you know, um, lifestyle. And so I wanted to honor her, honor her in that way and really choose what plants to dye her shroud with. And so it was through this, um, this experience that I really started creating this ceremony because I wanted to, I've been studying herbalism and plant lore and folk practices um, for a number of years. And I was just always fascinated with the, I guess I'll use the term, the like the magical properties of plants. And so not everyone is going to view this as a magical property. We have this thing, um, this is a, this little book, it's called The Language of Flowers. And this was Victorian times. Um, basically they took a bunch of different plants and flowers and they found the associations with them. And so people would send uh, bouquets to um, each other and depending on what flower or what plant they got had certain hidden meanings and so everyone you know would have these books and then they decipher you know what the bouquet meant and so in that sense we've always have had folk practices from all over the world um, that utilized plants and um, the associations. And so I wanted to imbue Scout's Shroud with these magical properties. And I also wanted to create a way that the community could be involved. And when I was talking to a friend, she said, well, why don't you just combine this and do your, you know, have people not just harvest these plants with you, but actually bring a plant that means something. And then they can, um, you know, dye the shroud with that. And I was like, okay, you don't understand. That's not how natural dyeing works. You know, like only certain plants give, uh, you know, color. But then I was like, hold on, I need to step back. I need to think about this as actually like, intention and, um, you know, really taking advantage of this opportunity to create this ceremony that the community can participate in. And so that is really how this all came apart together. And so I say that, you know, honoring death and transmuting grief through participation, these ceremonies are a way for us to really process someone who is going to die, someone who has died, and also creating a safe space where people can grieve, they can cry, they can be held by the people around them doing this act, you know, and um, and you'll see in these pictures coming up, oh, it's a little further back, is that most of the people in these pictures are all people in their 20s, you know, that this is the first time that many of them had ever experienced a death that close to them, that wasn't someone that they anticipated would die, you know, with a grandparent or um, someone who 
was older, you know, that was expected that that was going to happen. So I just wanted to quickly go over just a few of the plants that um, I've utilized in shrouds. Um, but I wanted to save the actual associations as part of the activity, the breakout rooms that we're going to do later on. So um, I didn't want to spend too much time because that'll be part of our discussion later. So these are just a few mugwort, St. John's wort, chamomile, nettle, dandelion. Okay, so I'm gonna just go through the process right now um, to show you how um, the shrouds are dyed. So I utilize um, a five piece shroud. We have a, the first layer is kind of, it's like a gown and the three other layers are equal um, lengths of fabric. And one goes around the feet and legs, one goes around the torso, and then one goes around the head and neck. And then there's an outer wrap that closes the entire um, body. And this is um, just mid-weight muslin, cotton, unbleached. Uh, so this is pretty much the cheapest um, fabric that you can buy to um, make a shroud, but you can utilize you know, your favorite bed sheets, you can utilize blankets, you know, it, it doesn't have to be something that you buy, you can just um, find something that will work. And so this is a picture of the community uh, dying ceremony. There was about 30 people and I laid out the different lengths of cloth and people brought, I, when I did the invitation, I you know, asked them to bring a plant or a flower um, that they wanted to imbue the shroud with. And you know, I said, don't worry if it's one that will uh, make a dye or not. So I, I add throughout the shroud um, dye plants, you know, just to make sure that there is, um, you know, some eco printing detail that happens to make it, you know, aesthetically pleasing. Um, but that's not necessary, you know, uh, it's really about the intention and the, the ceremony and just the participation that people are putting into this ceremony. We even have a little pot leaf down there. <laughs> we live in Southern Oregon, so uh, that's a, a part of our culture down here. Uh, kids, you know, being involved. This is something that they could, you know, slightly understand um, but I saw that a few of them weren't really understanding what we were doing until we had the three day vigil and we had scouts body shrouded laying in honor. Um, and then it became clicked, you know, like, oh, that's what we did the other day. And, um, you know, we'll utilize um, a little bit of chanting and create create that sacred container with the ceremony. So we had some um, smudge smoke and some chanting and um, the woman with the scarf around her neck um, was Scout's, is Scout's mom. And so she was able to meet the community that her daughter lived in um, you know, for the first time and see all of these people that had such love for her daughter and to be able to participate was such a moving thing for her. 
So this next one, um, during COVID, uh, doing a community ceremony wasn't really a safe option. And so this is Hazel. And this is the first time that um, I did a burial shroud with someone who was still living. And it was an amazing experience to have her participate. She wasn't physically able to lay things on the fabric, but she was able to be there. And, you know, for us to talk with her and say, like, this is the flowers, this is the plants we're putting for this part of the shroud. And, um, yeah, it was really, a, yeah, a great experience. I would love to do more shrouds with the people that are going to be, you know, surrounded by it. And we created uh, altars with the dye materials. Each, it was um, myself and two other folks, and we each created our own altar with the dye materials that we were gonna be utilizing. And so, um, and this is Hazel lived in, she built her own uh, cob house. So this is part of that. The other part that Hazel um, wanted to do is that she wanted to dye scarves that um, each of the three women that were doing her funeral, myself and the two other women, were co-creating and being the funeral celebrants, and then also her three daughters. And so we made six scarves. Uh, with during the same ceremony for all six of us to wear during her funeral. And so after we laid it down, we fold the fabric over and we roll it up and bundle it. And so I use copper pipes to roll it in because uh, that can act as the mordant um, to really brighten some of the colors. And the bundling you'll see in the pictures, uh, if anyone has done tie dye before, you know, it kind of keeps the dye from touching that part of the fabric. So it adds a design itself in the bundling. And so the first step that I do is I steam the bundles and this is a large pot that has an iron solution in the bottom and it has a strainer basket in the middle. So the bundles don't touch the iron water and all of this is done outside. You want to make sure that this is a uh, well ventilated. I use an outdoor camping stove um, because you don't wanna be inhaling um, the fumes in closed quarters. And then the second part, once I steam these for usually about two hours, and then I'll put them into the dye bath. And so this dye bath that you see on the right side is onion skins and it's red onion skins. And so I bring that um, not quite to a boil, just really getting it really hot. And I leave it to simmer for a couple of hours and then I turn it off and I let those sit in there. You can let them sit in there overnight. You can let them sit for a week. The longer you let these bundles just stay bundled, the more intense and rich these designs are going to be. Uh, there's folks that even put their Eagle print bundles in their compost pile because the heat from the compost pile will activate the magic that happens and uh, for months. And that's some India Flint, um, I believe, and some other natural dyers uh, in Eastern Europe, they utilize the more decomposing aspect of eco printing. 
So this is the onion skin, just the large piece of the outer shroud on the left. This is the iron solution that I have made for the, for the mordant and the steaming. And then on the right side, those are the bundles uh, the day that I unwrapped them. And so this, this is from Hazel's um, burial shroud. And those had been sitting for probably a week. They had been um, left unbundled or left bundled for a week. So um, unbundling them is kind of like one of the most exciting parts of the dying process. And uh, Deborah the, on the left, this is a picture from when we unbundled Scout's shroud together. And so that's, it's pretty mucky. It has a bunch of, you know, plant matter stuck to it. And, um, but you get excited because you start seeing these colors coming up that some of the leaves, you know, have started to shift. And so this is Hazel Shroud after um, I unbundled it and um, was spraying it off. Now, if you notice, um, on the sink here are some old doilies and linens. And I like to add these to the dye bath with the shroud bundles. And it's a really sweet gift to give to um, friends and loved ones because that doily, that piece of linen is imbued with the same plants, same energy that the burial shroud is. So a lot of people have utilized these um, as altar cloths or just added them to an ancestor altar um, or just having it you know, on your mantle as a reminder of your loved one. And these are some of the detailed pictures um, of Hazel's uh, shroud. Uh, the blue was from eucalyptus and I had never gotten that intense of a purple blue before. And so I was really curious of what the combination of what created that, because um, like I said, depending, or I guess, so depending on the pH of your water, depending on what pot you use, you know, how long um, you steam things, all of these can shift the colors and the reaction that takes place. This is a uh, scout's burial shroud hanging up to dry. So um, before we go into the breakout rooms together, I just wanted to go over some of the the dyeing books and the people that I found most helpful. Uh, Harvesting Color by Rebecca Burgess. She's from the United States and she has a book that basically um, goes seasonally and it tells you what plants and where in the States uh, for natural dyeing. Wild Color with Jenny Dean. Uh, she is a natural dyer from Europe and her books are really great, especially for understanding how mordants and pre-mordants will shift colors. Um, really great book. And then Eco Color um, is kind of like, it's an amazing book. It's, it's, it's giant, it's very detailed um, by India Flint. Um, so those are three books that I suggest people check out from their libraries, um, request your libraries to order them, um, and definitely utilize them. Also, Sacred Crossings um, is, the, is who I was trained to be a death midwife by Olivia Barham. Really great um, trainings that she does throughout the year. I'm gonna be assisting her next weekend on her level two trainings. So I'm looking forward to that. 
And like I said, so um, in the future, um, I'm going to be doing some workshops on how to do the type of um, burial shroud that I'm familiar with. And it's probably the cheapest um, and you don't have to be, you know, a seamstress. A lot of it is just cutting and ripping. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a trick of the, the people who sew will know what I'm talking about. It's how you get straight lines. And um, also I'm gonna be doing a eco printing a demonstration where we'll go step by step on how to create the burial shrouds with the ego printing. Uh, and I'm still coming up with that because it is um, late, like time intensive. And then also uh, we will be doing death sovereignty workshops talking about how to make sure your end of life wishes are um, being respected. And this is going to be geared towards the uh, queer and BIPOC communities. Um, and I'm gonna be working with different groups from different marginalized communities in Southern Oregon. Uh, and we're coming up with a whole workshop where, yeah, just make sure that um, People just understand how to make sure that they're not, uh, you know, dead named or that they have their partners um, are the ones that are able to uh, make those end of life decisions for them um, when marriage is not uh, on the table and to make sure that people understand that there are ways that you know, families that maybe aren't supportive of their decisions are legally the ones that will have control unless, you know, documents are signed and everything. So, uh, yeah, so this is my contact information. And so I wanted to uh, get out of the share. There we go. And so the one thing that I wanted, and I think it's like really fascinating is what people have already associated with different flowers and different plants. And so we all come from different cultural backgrounds. We all have our own different experiences. So I wanted to take the time to do breakout rooms. We're gonna do 15 minutes. Um, and I would like you to share with the group, um, whether you've thought about it, maybe just through today, what plants you would like to imbue your own burial shroud with, and, you know, some of the uh, associations with those plants that you have. And then just choose one person from your group to be the person who's gonna share that when we come back together as a group. And so then that way, you know, I could tell you what the associations are. I study plant lore, but I want this to be something that comes from you and comes from your culture. And, um, and then once we share that, then I'll uh, add any ones that we miss. Because more often than not, like we, we, we associate a lot with all these different plants and flowers. You don't have to be, you know, a tree hugging pagan person to <laughs> have this be part of your life. So um, Caitlin is going to do that. And so uh, we'll meet back in, yeah, 15 minutes and we'll share. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed your chance to, to share. I know it's a lot of information uh, at once and just cursory. So I look forward to going deeper with people in the future. So um, 
if people want to just unmute yourself, whoever uh, volunteered or who was chosen to share to the greater group, um, you can just unmute yourself. I'm not sure how to. Do you want us to start? Okay. So Michelle, uh, oh, okay. if you want to just state maybe where you're from and go into what you guys came up with in the group. Sure. I'm um, from West Central Alberta, Canada, Rocky Mountain House. And we had a great group, had lots of ideas, and I'll just list them off. We had lilacs, peonies, pansies, poppies, rose, blueberries, saskatoons, cedar, sunflowers, rosemary, Dominic, Dominica, I'm not sure, I can't, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, sorry? Damiana. Damiana, sorry. Um, then we had pot, mushrooms, spores, lavender, and I think that was it. And did anyone talk about the things that they associated with those plants? Mm, I think we had a little bit of discussion around um, um, just the plants that have meaning in our life and they hold some meaning in our life and we all have different associations with it, with what they mean, but there's definitely a meaning behind all of them. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And uh, the next group. Um, that would be our group. I'm Stephanie. I'm in group two. I'm currently live in, in Texas. Um, yeah, we had a great group too. A lot of people that had a lot of things in common that we didn't realize, first of all. Um, people mentioned a lot of plants. They also were just very intrigued with the idea of the ceremony of doing the shrouds, um, as well as being aware that, you know, different plants are available during different seasons, so you can't always get real attached. So just some of the plants we had, um, I said old lady flowers, which to me is like hydrangeas and peonies, some of those, tree leaves. Um, some folks said they liked some, they were specific about some of the colors they liked. So they want, want like a plant that would produce a blue or a purple color. Um, roses, a lot of folks like roses. Um, some folks didn't like roses. Um, greens from the forest, yellow roses that signify friendship, tiger lilies as reminders of childhood. Um, old time flowers were mentioned, lilies of the valley, Dahlia, Nicotinia, cedars, maples, roses again. You know, for some people they had real specific um, memories or uh, things that had happened um, associated with those plants. And then one woman says she has a big garden so she'd like folks to just go pick flowers out of her garden and, and use those. Hopefully, I didn't leave anything out that someone needed to have noted. Great, thank you. I like that idea of just opening up the garden and letting people harvest. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Do we have another volunteer? Oh, I, yeah, I will do, I, there were four of us in breakout room one, um, another great group. Uh, so I thought of one, the sumac plant, because I grew up in Northwestern Wisconsin and Minnesota and uh, sumac was very plentiful there. And I have very strong, uh, all four seasons, um, childhood love of that plant and uh, Mia talked about Datura and having a really strong symbolic uh, association with Datura 
as a reminder not to take the poison, even though it's beautiful and alluring, and having that have personal meaning uh, for them, and, and then also mentioning sage, ginkgo, and chamomile. And Vicky had a strong association with maple and safflower and rosemary, uh, talking about the, the love of the shapes and the colors and being amazed by the dye that the safflower produces and her own dyeing ex um, experiments. Uh, Crystal talked about St. John's wort with its meaning as the sunshine plant for them and uh, also uh, vegetables, a lot of vegetables and fruit dyes to symbolize the work that they do in food justice. And then also uh, for their love of water, having an interest in anything that would produce a, a vibrant blue, cyanotypes or indigo, something along those lines. And then Crystal also mentioned their, their uh, experience with dyeing with purple cabbage beets and turmeric once, which, which, which kind of made us kind of expand our thoughts on, on what we could use. That's, that's what we talked about. Nice, thank you, Emily. Uh, I guess a comment on the, the beets and the cabbage and more of the food um, dyes. A lot of those are not light fast, so they fade with direct sunlight and, um, you know, we utilize those for dyeing Easter eggs and, you know, things like that because it's not going to last very long. So that is one thing with the burial shrouds is if you keep them, you know, tucked away, then that we could utilize, you know, some of those dyes. Or um, if a burial shroud is, you know, happening right after um, or right before someone dies, you know, it's not going to last. So the fact that it's going to be decomposing, it's going to be going into the ground or being cremated. Um, yeah, we can expand what we would be dying with. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up, Emily. Okay, uh, so the next group. I can speak for group four. Um, don't know where my own little video is. So we, we all kind of had a lot of similarities with ours as well. Um, I didn't write them down because we just now kind of decided on who was speaking, but um, roses were uh, constant with it, with all of us. Um, there were some affinities for trees. All of us had a big affinity for moss, um, other plants such as mugwort or specific ones that kind of have more of an association with uh, protective funerary folklore, um, such as parsley or mandrake. Um, Again, mugwort, cedar, and um, sweet grass was brought up, which I thought was really lovely. Um, trying to remember specifically what else, birch um, is another one. And if anyone from my group wants to chime in with something that I'm forgetting that's really important, please do so. Um, but yeah, that was kind of our, our common themes. We had some good conversations. Thank you, Bree. And we should have another group, I believe. Well, I think if maybe. everybody is uh, speaking from all the groups, I think maybe that sounds good. <laughs> I know that I did not really speak in our group, but I heard the conversation and it was fantastic. Um, I know one person wanted to add cinnamon and nutmeg into the mix for the scent, which I think was a wonderful idea. And another one liked Linden because it, it was the meaning of her name. Awesome. Thank you, Susie. It's good to see you. 
It's good to see you too. So, um, so a, a really good way to, you know, figure out the different um, affiliations beyond your own personal experience is the study of plant lore. And I am such a dork for folklore and plant lore. And um, one of the people that I have found um, the most inspiring early on in my studies is an herbalist and folk practitioner named Corinne Boyer. Um, they are up in Washington, north of Seattle, and um, they introduced me to this book. I don't know if you can see this. This is the Dictionary of Plant Lore by D.C. Watts. Uh, it's amazing, and he, he actually died before he completed it. So unfortunately, um, all of the content is in the book, but the table of contents and the um, index is not. So it makes it a little bit of an adventure to, you actually literally have to read it like a book. It's alphabetical, but um, it doesn't make it easy on you. Uh, so that's a really good um, resource for learning about plant lore. And um, yeah, I think that I'm just going to open it up to uh, discussion, question and answer um, right now, because I feel like people might have um, some things that they want to ask. So if you want to uh, just unmute yourself, or if you have a question, if you don't feel like you want to speak in front of the group, you could write it in the chat and maybe Caitlin can keep an eye on that. Yeah. So it is 12.30, almost 12.30 right now. So this leaves us um, a half an hour. If you want to drop out at this point, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, thank you for coming. And if not, then we can just have a, a chat a discussion. So anyone who wants to unmute and ask a question, you can just do that. I have a question. Um, so quick, uh, there, if you're familiar with Zoom, um, there is a little uh, reactions kind of button down at the top bottom and you can raise your hand or do a little uh, <laughs> something like that if you have a question too. So go ahead and uh, chime in, please. I have a question. <laughs> go for it. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> it's Michelle. Um, this is actually a question that came up in our group and I, di I didn't mention it before, but um, somebody wanted to know if when you're dyeing all of these pieces for your shroud, can they be re-dyed again? Because somebody was talking about um, creating their shroud and a lot of um, maybe plants or flowers or whatever they wanted to use are not in um, season. And so very, uh, dyeing it with the seasonal plants and then maybe later on re-dyeing it again with other plants. Now, is that recommended or should you just do maybe one piece for the fall, one piece for the spring? Like what's your thoughts? I think that you could re-dye um, and that, you know, that's kind of a, a really great aspect, you know, to do a one piece per season and um because there are the four pieces and then the fifth outer you know piece so it's a it's a grand experiment yeah but i mean technically re-dying it wouldn't be an issue um it just might not be quite as bright of a reaction. Um, yeah, I've never done the entire process twice, but I will experiment and see if 
I could do the alum and all of the pre-mordant um, ahead of time. I guess if you don't wash it with soap, then it'll stay in. So just don't machine wash it after and wait until, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I'll go ahead. Um, so, oh my gosh, now I'm here and I'm gonna lose my train of thought. Okay. Um, do Have you found that you get any pushback from like funeral directors or from the, you know, the more industry side? Um, I live in a really conservative area and I already get kind of pushback for my home birth advocacy. So I'm kind of worried about how the funeral um, director here, I guess it's only, there's only one funeral director, how they would um, go about that. And I also like, are there, do you think that every state maybe different has different, has different legalities that we would have to look into um, to be able to provide those services? Um, so uh, in regards to home funerals, uh, every state you can have a home funeral. Um, some states require you to utilize a funeral director, um, but most states you can act as your own funeral director. Uh, the laws surrounding death care, you know, were really created to protect the families, not to protect the funeral homes, you know, so to keep, you know, the the rights to your uh, loved one's bodies, you know, is the family's right. So in the small, now in means of doing natural burials, the funeral industry is an industry. It's, uh, you know, it's the motivation more than not is monetary. You know, it's a service that they're providing, and it's only been since the Civil War where really uh, funeral homes, that was like really the big push for embalming, um, for creating caskets, and that was to, you know, temporarily preserve the soldiers' bodies enough to get them home for the burials. And so up until then, before then, it was the families that were doing all of the death care. It really truly was community death care. And it only became this specialized medicalized thing from the civil war on. And so you really, um, I'm not sure in every state, but I know in Oregon and maybe some other folks that are in other um, states that are death doulas or death midwives in Oregon, um, the funeral home has to receive any receptacle that you give them, like any casket. And, uh, you know, you can also do a cremation cardboard box. And that is, you know, something that they will take. So your relationship with your small town funeral director um, is just something that it's gonna be, um, it might be difficult, it might not be, you know? And so just to come at it with like a lot of questions and a lot of openness, um, you know, is always best and so there's just your question there's a lot of different areas so if there's like specifically if you're talking about um if you were not having a home funeral and you were in a hospital and you were uh died at a hospital or at a facility and then you wanted to be shrouded that's going to be like a little extra step because you will have to um, talk with a funeral director. And oftentimes um, people are familiar with Jewish burial practice, practices. And so they will offer the ability for someone to come in and wash and shroud. Um, so it just depends on 
how open they are. And even if they're not open, having a little bit of education can go a long way saying like, I want to do this and looking up what the laws are, because you'll find that a lot of people assume that things are not legal when they actually are. It's just like, oh, well, I thought that that wouldn't be, you know, okay. But then you have to say, well, let show me where it says that I can't do this. Because one of my, when my mother um, in Missouri, they allowed us to use, you know, a room to wash her body and to shroud her. And then when we got to the funeral home, he was like, oh, you can't have an open casket if she's not embalmed. And we're like, what? How is that possible? Like, there's nothing contagious. There's no health concerns. And we had to like negotiate with him to allow us 15 minutes before we opened the funeral home to the public to have an open casket for 15 minutes. And then we had to shut it. And then we had the funeral service in the funeral home. So it's kind of like, you never know. And you just have to, um, yeah, come at it with love. And I'm going to let Susie talk because she knows a lot about the legalities. Yes, I, I used to work at a mortuary. Um, so I would say half the prop half the problem there would be more EDRS because of the death certificate. And if you can find a way, uh, and I'm not going to say it's easy because it's funeral directors are hit or miss really is if you can really befriend that funeral director you can kind of see if you can have an arrangement where they allow you to do the home funeral while they take care of the EDRS process which is the death certificate because I would say in the entire process yes memorize the laws and the legalities but EDRS creating the death certificate is the most problematic part. <laughs> depending on which state you're in. I know here in California, you really need to get that done. And so if you're taking that body, you're gonna have to do EDRS by paper, which sucks. <laughs> and so, um, and if you don't know what the EDRS is, it's the electronic death registration system. So every death is recorded and a death certificate is made. And with that death certificate, you get a permit, which is a, that's given to a person where it's pretty much says you're allowed to bury this person here or this is where the site of disposition is. Um, so if you can sneak your way and charm that one funeral director and kind of have an arrangement where you can be like a death advocate for them but like when the family is ready, you'll call them up and he can like get that EDRS going for you while you help set up the body. That would be ideal, depending where you are. Nice. And I'll just chime in. So I um, just with Hazel was the first time that I uh, did a um, death certificate without any assistance. And so that was um, interesting because in Oregon, we can do home burials. And um, so we not only had the home funeral, but we also had a home burial. So she never left home from the time she was sick in hospice, died, you know. And so there, there's a bit of finagling and the vital records office. I had her on the phone with me, the person who sent me the home burial packet that had the death certificate. And she was amazing. She like step-by-step, step, like, this is what you need to fill out. If you have any questions, let me know, you know? And so a lot of people will help you figure these out. You just have to find who that person is in the government um, agencies. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Anastasia, you had your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Such a great workshop, Angela. Um, I have a question about the washing because um, I don't know, I've done things in the past with kind of magical vibrational things and then use like a soap or something else and it feels like it kind of washes that energy out of it. So do you actually use soap or do you just really rinse it well or, you know, is that uh, personal? Uh, so what I have done, 
um, is just use Dr. Bronner's uh, lavender soap. And so you can add, you know, essential oils to that if you want. Um, and with Dr. Bronner's, you don't really have to rinse that much, you know? So you have, you know, a warm, you know, soapy water, and then you can do like once over with that. And then you can change out the water, do it again. And then the final is just kind of a, just a wet washcloth with just water. We call it Bronner's baths when, you know, when it's our personal <laughs> thing. And I find that that is good. Um, I have, you know, utilized when I was washing um, a body in a funeral home with a family and uh, it had been a, a car accident and uh there was a lot of um, just, you know, fluids and it wasn't, uh, you know, what people would consider a pleasant um, experience. It was still like very moving and I mean, amazing and beautiful, but we utilized, you know, the soap that was at the funeral home and because, and we wore gloves and, you know, so every, every washing, every death is going to be different. So there's not one way, but I feel, you know, when you can just use, you know, the Dr. Bronner's and then um, after that is when I put um, more of the infused, the imbued oils and waters and do anointing. And so- I meant the fabric, Angela. Oh, the fabric. I thought you were talking about the body. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm sure everybody appreciated that nonetheless, but yeah. Oh yeah, no. So the fabric, um, I actually don't use soap. Uh, I just rinse it off and then um, I'll put it in the washing machine. If I feel like the plant material isn't coming off uh, and just, just run it with just water. Uh, and I've, you know, with hazel shroud, I just basically sprayed it off and let it dry. You know, it still had little pieces of balsam buds, you know, because it was so sticky and resinous. And, you know, she was a wood witch. Like, she, it was like part, I'm like, I'm, this is, this is what hazel would want, you know? So, um, so yeah, I don't think you need to wash it with soap. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> okay. So it looks like um, we've got a question in the chat here. And it looks like Vicki is asking, where do you find fabric that is safe for burial and how do you determine their eco-friendly nature? I muted you, Angela. So. <laughs> Uh, so what I do, it depends on the level of your eco-friendly that you want. Um, any fabric is not going to be, um, an eco-friendly, truly, um, thing because anything that's mass produced is going to be utilizing practices that are not necessarily great. Even the bamboo fabrics that we have, the process that it takes to process bamboo is very intensive. So a lot of things that say, you know, um, organic and every not, it's really hard to come by something that's truly going to be, um, uh, yeah. And so I, um, I feel like I mean, if you can weave yourself, <laughs> you know, fabric and do that, I mean, that's amazing. Nettles, that's the use to, you know, making um, burial shrouds with nettles. It would be amazing. I would love that. Um, so I use unbleached muslin um, is mainly what I use because I can afford it. 
and um, because it's unbleached, it's not using the chemicals as much uh, in the process. Uh, there are other fabrics that you can buy that are organic, um, that are pretty costly. Um, and those, I haven't found um, a company, it's just kind of out of my price range to do um, going that route, but they are definitely out there. Um, it looks like someone put, Genevieve put that there's someone in Iceland who weaves her own organic materials. So yeah, there's lots of little um, things and growing your own flax, making the linen. Yeah. Um, so there, is there another, how many yards of fabric go into the five part shroud? So um, I usually use 10 yards of fabric, but I find every single time I'm like, oh, I wish I had a little bit more. So I, um, I would say like 15 yards of fabric would be for, um, I don't want to say a regular size person because like everyone is so unique in, you know, uh, their body shape and everything. So, um, that would be, yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, so there should be a formula that I can find if anyone has their, um, their measurements. I know that there's, um, patterns online and with this, because we're not sewing anything, we're just utilizing the different um, pieces of fabric. It's really easy to accommodate for someone who's smaller or someone who's bigger. What, about, uh, hey, hey. what I mean, was width, that? Width makes sense, but how do you, uh, seems like height would be even more of a factor. Yeah, because when uh, the shroud, the very, um, the largest piece of shroud would be the most important because that uh, the way that you wrap it is that, you know, it's, you're laying on it, you wrap it over the feet, you wrap it somewhat over the head to leave the face exposed. And then you wrap one side over and then the other. There's special ways of uh, folding it and in the, my shrouding, workshop that I'll be doing, like I'll have diagrams and maybe even get someone to lie down and let me shroud them for people <laughs> so that can see exactly how to do it. Um, so 30, yeah, so 36 inches is uh, a yard and that's three feet. So if someone is six feet, then the outer one would need to be at least one, two, three, four, five, five yards um, long to really enclose. And that's someone who's six feet or less. But I'll go over the specific measurements of a shroud um, in a more in-depth workshop because there's different ways even with what I do there's there's always um different um ways to wrap and not even utilize you know a five-piece shroud so you could do three pieces um similar to the the male um shroud that they use in the Muslim burial traditions I just like the smaller ones because having more smaller pieces are easier to dye with the eco printing because the very large ones, having to like fold them and make sure that the plants stay in place, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, so having the one large piece, doing that once seems, you know, okay, but doing that <laughs> a bunch of times, I, it's, yeah, a pain. 
Uh, so someone said, can you use the eco dyeing process on silk? I don't know what throasters are, but, um, but silk, so that's another thing is that um, the eco dyeing works really well on plant or on animal fibers. So that would be silk and wool. Um, and then on the cellulose fibers like cotton um, and linen, it, you have to do kind of like an extra step sometimes. Um, with the protein fibers, usually just the alum premordant will be good enough. But with the cotton, um, some people use uh, a protein premordant like soy milk is a really common one that people will use um, to make sure that the plant adheres to the cotton. Okay. Yeah. Um, Angela, so I had the question and this yeah. is like silk throasters. Oh. And like, oh, you remember Pia, right? Yeah. And so this is what she used to create that whole weird silk cocoon. Ah. And so I was just wondering if like, is there a way you can just like dip dye with the eagle? I'm pretty sure you could dip yeah. dye with just the natural, yeah. 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 I definitely can't hold it without ruining this whole thing. <laughs> so. Yeah, eco printing on it would not happen, but the, yeah. just natural dyeing. Yeah. Uh, Becca? I'm just curious about, um, I'm in Oregon, so um, is it possible to just shroud someone and then have them cremated? Will they accept that? So um, they will accept that if they are in the, you just have to put it in the cardboard um, cremation casket. And so that's typically what okay. happens when you have a direct cremation. Um, people do get cremated okay. in their crazy caskets, you know, which is insane to me that someone would spend, yeah. And the amount of pollutants that, happens with <laughs> cremation is yeah. a lot you know unfortunately awesome. uh, you know a lot of people you know have moved towards cremation because it's more environmentally friendly because of not using the um you know the casket okay. or the cement liners and whatnot but it still utilizes a lot of resources um and the amount yeah yeah so, but um, yeah, with the shrouds, I mean, you can shroud someone for cremation. You can shroud someone for a traditional okay. burial. You know, it pretty much will go for anything, not just a natural burial. And is there a limit on how many days um, you can keep them without embalming? So in every state, every country is going to be different. Um, in the um, in Oregon, I can speak mainly to Oregon because that's where I practice. And in Oregon, um, you have to refrigerate within 24 hours. And so what that means is you have to utilize um, dry ice or um, techy, techny ice, or I'm not sure. It's like the ice packets. It's a special type of ice, um, uh -huh. frozen packets. And so that is considered refrigeration. Oh, that's not nice. Yeah, it's very easy. It doesn't take a lot. Um, you just have to consider how dry ice can hurt yourself when you're handling it. So you have to handle it specially and make some considerations to make sure that when it evaporates, the wetness doesn't damage um, any bedding. And then also, uh, there needs to be ventilation because it gases off. And so you want to have some good ventilation in the room. Um, but there's no, uh, if you have refrigeration, there's no really limit on, okay. um, but um, in experience and with most people's experience, three days is pretty much what you want to do, you know, like 
our bodies start doing its natural thing and yep um, yeah so I feel like even on the fourth day um, it can become unpleasant for people and Mm -hmm. not that that's a you know something that we want to to avoid um, because it is a natural thing um, but it is something that happens things start shifting and changing thank you yeah uh, the techie ice packs, how many would you use? Um, so with the techie ice packs, I think changing them more often than the dry ice. And so typically you put them, um, one behind the head on behind the shoulder blades, uh, and the lower back, mainly where organs are. And so what you're doing is you're just slowing the process of decomposition and just temporarily, you know, like halting that. So um, with the techie packs, you just wanna make sure you have enough to switch it out, like have the same amount in the freezer as you have under the body to just, you know, keep it going. And it depends on the time of year. If it's winter time and it can be cool, then you don't have to really worry much. But during the summertime when it's super hot, (laughs) then you're going to be wanting an air conditioner maybe in the room and you want to utilize the cooling techniques. Does anyone else have any more questions? Okay, well, we have about four minutes left. And um, so Marsha is asking how flowers became a part of the funeral. So I believe flowers became part of the funeral because of folk practices. You know, um, most cultures were way more connected with the natural world around them. And um, so people have used um, flowers because there have been full practices and more of that connection. Um, The scent as well, that's why we anoint, um, you know, a lot of cultures anoint with oils and smelly things um, because it helps with, uh, just the smells that happen with um, when you're having a body around. Okay. Uh, Well, um, I wanna thank everyone for coming and uh, yeah, just stay tuned for more offerings um, from uh, myself and Uh, Crossroads Community Death Care, and we'll be doing a uh, more intensive eco-printing workshop um, through the the guild. Um, We'll set that up uh, for the future. So thanks everyone. And yes, Caitlin's going to close us out. (laughs) Thanks everyone for joining today for our special um, creative community series offering. And so we will be sending out a link to the recording if you wanna rewatch this again, um, probably sending that out early next week along with a brief survey uh, from us just to help us do this better, how to offer more efficient online things. So we would really appreciate it if you filled out the survey, just took a few minutes to do that. So thank you so much for everybody for joining today. And um, we look forward to seeing you, you all again. Thank you.